So now that we've introduced the structure and idea behind capillaries, we're going to entitle the next flowchart capillaries and focus entirely on their function and how capillaries do their job of exchanging material with the cells that need it. So capillaries are going to be very important in the movement of substances, materials, let's say, movement of substances, and this is going to be between two areas of focus right now. This is what circulation is all about. It culminates in this event. Movement of substances between the blood, which is the circulatory fluid that we know every circulatory system has and is pumped via a heart, and also tissue. And we're just saying tissue in this situation, but it's just the same thing as saying a cell or an organ. We're just looking at it at a tissue level. Now, the reason why we want movement of substances is because this is going to allow for, let's say, the diffusion of certain things like gases, oxygen going towards a tissue, and CO2 going away from a tissue so that it can be breathed out. Diffusion occurs. Gas exchange, you could say, also occurs just like we've just covered. So gas exchange may also occur at this movement of substances. Waste removal, so cells will always have some sort of waste that they need to get rid of. That will occur at this moment also. And also nutrient arrival. So blood, again, is a highway. It carries things towards places that need those things. These are just a couple of examples of how that's done. And this is all at the capillary level. Now, another idea about the capillary to understand is how we have the end result, which is known as interstitial fluid. How do we get to that? We've mentioned ISF before, but we never really understood its origin and where it comes from. It has a lot to do with capillaries. Let's begin by understanding plasma. Plasma is just the fluid component of blood. So if you took blood and took out all of the cells from it, the red blood cells, let's say, and you just are left with the fluid that makes up blood, that's what plasma is. It's a fluid component of blood. It has no cells within it. And so what we understand about plasma is that constantly within a closed circulatory system, blood will be under a decently high pressure. There's going to be a pretty, uh, low, a pretty high level of pressure um, throughout the blood that's seen within a closed circulatory system. So we can state the following. In a closed CS, a closed circulatory system, because of the high pressure that's associated with blood and the blood vessels that it travels through, what often happens is that some plasma, some of the fluid component of blood, some of that is actually going to be sort of leaking out and being forced out because of the high amount of pressure. That's the force forced out into those areas of exchange into tissues. Sometimes tissues are going to end up being sort of bathed in plasma. Once plasma has left the blood, has left the circulatory system, has left circulation, it is now going to be referred to as ISF. This is now ISF, which stands for interstitial fluid. This is a fluid that will bathe the tissues. It covers the tissues. It's extracellular but it's still not a part of the circulation because, again, what has stayed in circulation is blood. Blood, which is the primary component, primary circulatory fluid, that structure, that stuff, is still in the circulatory system. But the plasma that has been forced out due to the high pressure that's found within blood vessels, that stuff is now ISF. ISF, therefore, is out of the circulatory system, and because it's out of the circulatory system, it contains no more red blood cells. No red blood cells, no cells whatsoever. It does contain some proteins, so some of the plasma, the ISF, that's bathing tissues, contains some proteins. About 25% of it will contain some proteins at some level. But overall, it's going to be just a bunch of water, a bunch of fluid. And because it has a lot of fluid within it, it will have less solutes. Those are dissolved substances within fluids as compared to blood. So less solutes than blood. So now what we have to ask is, is blood hypertonic or hypo, or is ISF hypertonic or hypotonic to blood? ISF, if it has less solutes, less dissolved substances than blood, ISF would be considered a hypotonic solution if you compare it to blood itself. 
This is going to be important when we look at the ways and different forces associated with material exchange. So for right now, just know that a ISF that's leaked out, that's been forced out of the blood uh, vessels due to high pressure, it's hypotonic to blood, and blood is hypertonic to ISF. It has more solutes, ISF has less solutes. So let's take a look now at how this results and what influence this has on the movement of material. So in capillaries, what we notice is that fluid itself moves back and forth. Fluid is going to move back and forth between the capillaries and the other structure, which are tissues in this flowchart. We're focusing on tissues. So between capillaries and tissues, we have this back and forth movement. Um, and this is going to be through opposing forces. That's all we're going to state for right now. What are these opposing forces? What is allowing something to go out of a capillary and into a tissue, or something go from a tissue back into a capillary? There are two basic forces to understand here. The first one is one that we're a bit familiar with thus far, known as blood pressure. And the other competing force, so we'll say versus, is osmotic pressure. So let's take a look at the difference and what the end-all be-all goals of each of these forces is. They are antagonistic. They fight against each other. Blood pressure is going to be defined as the pressure that is extended or that is exerted on the capillary wall, so the cap wall, due to the heart pumping. So the heart exerts this sort of high pressure because of its ventricular contractions that causes an overall pressure throughout the capillaries of the body. That's blood pressure. That's measuring how much pressure the blood is exerting on capillary walls. Because of this pressure, we noticed here that sometimes because of this high pressure that blood is under due to the heart pumping, some plasma sometimes leaves. Some of the fluid component of blood leaves. And therefore, this pressure, blood pressure specifically, pushes plasma out of capillaries. And if plasma is pushed out of capillaries, it has turned into ISF, interstitial fluid, fluid that's surrounding tissues and that is no longer a part of the circulatory system. That's the end-all be-all result of blood pressure. What about osmotic pressure? Osmotic pressure is a little different. If you look at ISF and compare it to blood, let's look at blood. Blood is something that has more solutes in it than ISF. So we'll switch it around here. Blood is hypertonic to ISF. ISF is hypotonic to blood. Same thing that we're saying, just in a different way. Blood is hypertonic to ISF, and so because of this situation, ISF, which has lots of water, wants to flow back into blood. This is an opposing force. This is the basic idea of osmosis. Water wants to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Blood is hypertonic. It has lots of tonic, lots of solute. ISF is hypotonic. Not a lot of solutes, not a lot of tonic. Therefore, ISF wants to go back into blood. Now, how can it do that if you have this constant blood pressure telling ISF to stay out of blood, to be pushed out of blood in this plasma form? These are two things that are fighting each other. So what is the end result of this? How do we end up with some sort of conclusion? When we have blood pressure and osmotic pressure, both allowing fluid to move back and forth between capillaries and between tissues, in this situation from capillaries to tissues, in this situation from tissues back to capillaries, who wins? Well, it depends on what part of the blood vessel you're looking at. If we look at the arterial, the arterial end of a capillary, this is the end of a capillary that has a lot of blood pressure in it, a high amount of blood pressure because it's coming away from the heart. The heart pumps stuff and it gives it a very high blood pressure when it pumps blood. Therefore, in this situation, blood pressure is greater than osmotic pressure. And we will state that the net movement, the majority of the movement of substances in this situation will be out of the capillary. 
out of the capillary and into the surrounding cellular tissue environment, whatever it may be. But contrastingly, if we look at what is known as the venous end of the capillary, the end of the capillary that is not subject to the heart, but is subject to the pressure caused by, let's say, muscle movement, this is going to be a situation in which blood pressure is less than the osmotic pressure. And in this part, in this moment, the net movement of substances will follow the route of osmotic pressure. The net movement will be into, back into, I should say, back into the capillaries, because that's where it came from. That's where the ISF came from. It just turned from plasma into ISF once it leaves the circulatory system. I think a good way to understand this is to look at figure 42.14 to really see the difference between both of these events, blood pressure versus osmotic pressure. So, final thing we want to state about capillaries is that there's actually a bit of a problem that results as a, uh, as a result of this capillary uh, battle between blood pressure and osmotic pressure. The problem is that not all of the fluid, not all of the fluid that's outside of, this, uh, of the capillaries, that's outside of the blood vessels, actually returns to capillaries. Okay? Even if osmotic pressure is winning, not all of that fluid returns back to the capillaries. About 15% stays and remains within the tissues. This is just a bit of an inefficiency that our circulatory system has. If 15% remains, how do we get rid of this 15% if we need to? Where does the 15% go? Because it's too much fluid to be staying around tissues. It has to go somewhere. And that is going to be then be a problem that's solved via the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is very good at picking up this interstitial fluid that remains and putting it into its own circulatory system. That's what we'll conclude in the final flowchart on when we focus on the lymphatic system.